This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Aristotle was a Renaissance man who lived almost two millennia before the Renaissance. He wrote on many, many subjects, politics, rhetoric, biology, logic, music, poetry, and much more. But none of his writings attract more interest than those on ethics. Terry Irwin has spent most of his career at Cornell University, but is now Professor of Ancient Philosophy at Oxford. Terence Irwin, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you for coming. The topic we're focusing on today is Aristotle's ethics. Could you just tell us a bit about who Aristotle was? Well, some of the bare bones about what we know. He was born in um, 384 BC. He was son of a doctor, and he was a Macedonian, and that's significant in that from the point of view of Athenians, he was barely a Greek. He spent 20 years as a member of Plato's Academy, and then he left Athens on Plato's death in 347. He travelled around the eastern Aegean a wee bit, and among other things, he engaged in uh, natural history. He returned to Athens in 338 and set up his own philosophical school, the Lyceum, and he organised a large programme of research, not only in philosophy, as we would think of it now, but also in biology and in constitutional history, chronology, and many other things. And he died in 322, just a year after Alexander the Great died, whom Aristotle is supposed to have taught. And one of the things he taught at the Lyceum was ethics, how to live. Could we just get a sense of what his general approach was to that question, how should we live? Well, maybe we could begin with the word. Aristotle is probably the first person to call this subject ethica, and that means literally the study of character. So as Aristotle looks at it, it's an aspect of political science. It's the most general aspect of it in that it tries to discover the ultimate good for a human being. So Aristotle argues to achieve that good We need various things, and in particular, virtues of character. So that's why the work's called On Character, like Ethica. And the virtues involve the appropriate development and ordering of emotions and uh, non-rational impulses. The virtues include really two kinds. One you might call self-regarding, to do with one's own good. So, for instance, uh, bravery involves the appropriate direction of fear and confidence, and temperance involves the appropriate direction of physical impulses. And secondly, there are the other regarding virtues that are to do with one's own good as including and identified with the good of others. So Aristotle argues, since we have a social nature, our good includes friendship with other individuals and more generally social and political community. And he believed that if we cultivate these virtues appropriately, we will flourish as human beings. He has a lot to say about flourishing and about what it is to be human. He thought there was such a thing as human nature, which gave rise to this flourishing when we are behaving in the appropriate sort of way. But maybe I could begin with human nature. Aristotle takes it to include both the physical and the mental, both the non-rational and the rational aspects of a person insofar as they're formed or permeated or guided by rational thought. So you could say the fulfilment of a human nature, it's its organisation of the rational and non-rational aspects of a human being so that they would realise human capacities as a whole. And that's the condition that Aristotle describes, as I mentioned before, as the human good, which he also calls eudaimonia. That term is usually translated into English by happiness. When you talk about flourishing, I'm not so keen on that rendering. Flourishing is something that trees can do, but they can't manage to be um, eudaimon, according to Aristotle. Only rational agents can do that. So eudaimonia is like happiness as we might ordinarily understand it, in that it includes mental elements, pleasure, sense of well-being, satisfaction. But it's not confined to those mental elements. It requires pleasure and satisfaction, you might say, in the appropriate activities for a rational agent. 
So that's the way in which eudaimonia is similar to and dissimilar to what you might think of as happiness. These virtues that give rise to eudaimonia, they have to be exercised according to the doctrine of the mean. What is the doctrine of the mean? Maybe its importance has been exaggerated a little bit. Some people understand it as advice to aim at moderation in all things. That's a phrase that's a mistranslation of a sentence by St. Paul. So it's also a misinterpretation of Aristotle. What he means by it is that virtue of character doesn't consist simply in expressing the impulses that one might acquire from nature or upbringing. And on the other hand, it's not simply an ascetic characteristic that involves uh, suppressing these impulses. So it's something between the extremes of letting it all hang out and repressing everything. So in that respect, it's in the middle or mean. What he intends by that is the appropriate harmony of non-rational and rational impulses under the guidance of practical reason. So if you take bravery as an illustration, the brave person doesn't try to suppress fear altogether, but the brave person's the one who is afraid in the right conditions and for the right reasons, but not on the occasions when it would be interfering with acting in the appropriate way. So that's how the general claim about the mean applies to this particular virtue. Aristotle has been tremendously influential, both in his own time and subsequently. Could you outline some of the ways in which he influenced other people? Maybe I could just mention two special periods of revival or renewal of Aristotle in ethics. The first, roughly from the 13th to the 17th century, the so-called period of scholasticism. And contrary to the associations of the name, this is an extremely creative development and systematic working out of Aristotelian ethics by Christian philosophers and theologians. So that would run roughly from Aquinas in the middle of the 13th century to Suarez at the beginning of the 17th century. Then the second period of renewal you might place in the 19th century and the main figures would be Hegel and Marx and the British Hegelians, especially Green and Bradley. So they looked to Aristotle to overcome some of the false assumptions as they see it, that are shared by moralists in the empiricist and rationalist traditions, Hume on one side and Kant on the other. And similarly, they look to Aristotle to overcome some of the false political assumptions that they attribute to both conservative and liberal political theories of the 18th century. And Aristotle didn't just influence philosophers in the 19th century, he's continuing to influence philosophers now. Yes, maybe I could give a couple of examples of that. It's really a continuation of the influence of the two periods of renewal that I just mentioned. On the one hand, there's the renewed interest among moral philosophers in the study of character and the virtues and the aspects of morality that involve being a certain way or living a certain kind of life rather than simply acting in certain ways. And second example would be the communitarian critique of liberal political theory, which clearly goes back to Hegel's critique of liberalism, but then beyond that also to Aristotle. Could you just expand on that a little bit and say what a communitarian approach is and how an Aristotelian approach stands in contradiction to that? One could draw a contrast between the view that the appropriate way to think about a state is as a way of achieving and protecting the interests of individuals. And on the other hand, the view that really goes back to Aristotle's claim that human beings are social and political in nature, that the appropriate aim of the state is to achieve the human good 
and that involves actually designing institutions and training people so as to cultivate the kinds of virtues that Aristotle is talking about. And that might have definite social and political consequences distinct from the view that it's mainly about protecting the interests of individuals. So that's a debate in contemporary political theory that clearly has its inspiration in Aristotle. You've obviously devoted a lot of time to studying Aristotle's ethics. What do you think he got right there? and Which aspects of his philosophy would you like to jettison? The description of his position that I've been giving is meant to be a sympathetic one. I don't want to jettison him, but really to correct him on certain points. And maybe I could just pick two things. Perhaps the most obvious thing, first of all, is that Aristotle thinks only a few human beings are naturally equipped to achieve the sort of life that he takes to be the best life. I think we know enough about human beings and the social influences on them to know that he's wrong about that. So we need to understand Aristotle, to put it briefly, from an egalitarian point of view. And that's where Marx's appropriation of Aristotle is especially important. And the second point, Aristotle thinks of practical reasoning in general, and hence moral reasoning in particular, as being ultimately concerned with one's own good or the good of the community in which one finds one's own good. And he should have recognised that that's not all there is to practical reasoning. He should have recognised that people also have duties and rights that are distinct from those goods. So if I were to put that point just in technical terms, it would say we need deontological as well as teleological practical reason. Or to put it in historical terms, we need a bit of Kant as well as a bit of Aristotle. So if we need a bit of Kant as well as Aristotle, could you just give an example of what that would mean in practice? That's the general point that there are some things that we owe to people that we don't owe to them because that will make us better off or them better off or society as a whole better off. So if, for instance, people are owed a certain degree of freedom of expression, if that's a right that they have, that's not something you need to justify by reference to anyone's good. And that's a point that I don't think you find in Aristotle. And it's a point that Kant is not the only person to emphasise, but one of the best known. So that's roughly what I mean in saying that there's one important aspect of morality that's missing from Aristotle. I could imagine somebody listening to this thinking, well, that's all very interesting historically, but is there any contemporary relevance to a philosopher like Aristotle? Why should I study Aristotle? What light does he shed on contemporary moral issues? I think there is a practical point, but it isn't that you can expect moral philosophy to give you answers to questions you might have about what to do here and now or what to vote for here and now. Those are questions sometimes for moral casuistry and sometimes for political thinking, and they're not necessarily questions that moral philosophy will answer. It will, however, provide principles that might guide us in formulating the right practical questions or evaluating acts or institutions or the design of a society. So it's the provision of those sorts of principles that I would take to be its practical point. Uh, would you like me to say something about the questions to which those sorts of principles would be relevant? Definitely, yes, please, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, perhaps I could just pick two that are connected with things I've been saying earlier. First question, what's education for and what should it include? So, for instance, should younger or older people be taught skills that will help them to function in the economy? Is that all there is to it? Or should they learn to live a good life? And can they be taught to live a good life? And can they be taught to live it without indoctrination? And what's wrong with indoctrination? So Aristotle stands pretty strongly on the interventionist side of this debate, thinking that learning to live a good life is something that can be taught and that it's an appropriate function for a state to undertake. So second question What's the right way to think about morality? And in particular, should we tell people and try to train them 
in such a way that they should limit their pursuit of their own interest so as to take account of other people. Or another way to look at it, should we learn to think of our own interest so that we recognise that we also pursue it in concern for the good of others? Now, that's not an unfamiliar way for people to think about their own interest in relation to others when they're thinking about their relation to members of their families or a small group of friends. But is it sensible to think of this identification of one's own interest with other people's interests in relation to a much larger group of people, people you don't know? And Aristotelian answer to that question is certainly yes, that the model of identification of interests and friendship extends to a much wider group of people. And if that's correct, it's a rather challenging way to look at morality and would affect the way that we think about such things as duties, self-sacrifice, concern for others. So that's one way in which an Aristotelian approach might change one's outlook on those aspects of morality. So just to get this clear, according to Aristotle, pursuing your own interests benefits other people. Perhaps it would be clearer to reverse that direction and say that it's in pursuing the interests of others you pursue your own. That's why there's no conflict. So that's not too hard to understand in the case of a parent doing something for their child. If you said, well, you're doing something for someone else and that's bad for you, the parent might say, that's ridiculous. What's good for the child is good for me too. There's no conflict of interest in that case. So that's something that it's possible to understand in some relations of friendship. And Aristotle's insight, or perhaps Aristotle's wishful thinking, is the claim that that model really fits other cases of concern for the interests of others too. So not just parent-child, but also one friend to another, fellow citizen to another, or even relations of concern for people you don't know anything about. So whether that's wishful thinking or an insight is a significant question about how we think about morality that we might learn about from Aristotle. Terence Irwin, thank you very much. Thank you. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.